So good morning, everyone. My name is Alon Avidan. Um, I'm at UCLA in the Sleep Center. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, sleep in uh, dementia. Now, notice my last name is Avidan and it kind of rhymes with Dr. Adivan. That's how a lot of my patients uh, refer to me when they have insomnia. And I think I'm in the right field. So for the f uh, next 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about uh, sleep in neurodegenerative disease in general. And I'm going to give you some anecdotes about sleep in, in dementia. I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, Dr. Joshua Grill for inviting me. So thank you so much. This is really a key issue. And I can tell you um, that oftentimes sleep is not part of the review of system. It's not something we um, often ask patients about um, what, what is the quality of, of their sleep? Do they snore? Do they have insomnia? And it's not only a review of system often, and it's, it's really uh, amazing because sleep is so important for uh, both addressing uh, the underlying um, quality of life that is so disrupted in these patients with chronic insomnia and fatigue and really impairs quality of life. Here are some of my disclosures. So uh, my outline is to go over the frequency of comorbid neurologic disease that have sleep as a core uh, symptom. Talk about the bidirectionality between neurologic disease and, and sleep disorders and give you some anecdotes about how sleep disruption can serve as a prognostic indicator for worsening dementia and also for, uh, especially in patients with Parkinson's disease, before the development of the Parkinsonism and um, also give you some anecdotes about treatment. So um, I don't need to belabor this point that the fastest growing segment of the population are those patients over age 65. And with that comes the fact that many of these patients are going to have disruptions in their sleep. All right, so this is a, I, I all want you to memorize this slide, but this is a, <laughs> basically showing how the circadian rhythms are generated. So you have light. Light is getting into the brain via the retinal hypothalamic tract. It's just a collection of neurons from the ganglion cells in a retina, and they all go right into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's the area labeled as SCN. The SCN is the internal collection of cells that help regulate sleep and wakefulness. So when you go to Europe, or, um, and if you have jet lag, it's a disorder of the circadian clock not being able to keep up with this rapidly changing time fluctuations from moving from one time zone into another. What I want you to know is that a lot of patients with underlying neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's patients, have degeneration of the specific nuclei, and it's not as robust to generate a circadian cycle, a circadian rhythm, that is healthy. So how do we help these patients? Well, we give them light. We give them more light to help readjust and stabilize the circadian cycle. Unfortunately, not getting enough light, having cataracts, which dis uh, prevents the light exposure from reaching the brain, wearing sunglasses, having disruption of the sleep environment are all factors that can disrupt the sleep, uh, the, the, the powerful circadian uh, cycle that helps regulate sleep and wakefulness in these patients. And with that comes also the disruption of uh, melatonin production by the pineal gland. The pineal gland tends to atrophy in Alzheimer's dementia. And um, you, melatonin, which is the hormone of darkness that helps us uh, fall asleep, is not having a robust signal to put us to, to sleep at night. And how can you increase melatonin production? Well, you can't really upregulate melatonin, but potentially melatonin supplements. Unfortunately, all the papers I've read on using melatonin in dementia, not, not, nothing really spectacular comes out. There are some studies showing that perhaps 10 milligrams in selected Alzheimer's patients may be helpful. The study has to be replicated. It's just one study that came out to be positive. So stay tuned for more data on the use of melatonin 
uh, specifically to address insomnia and, sleep and circadian disruption uh, in these patients. Um, again, another slide I, I don't want you to memorize. It's just to show you how many different nuclei in the brain are responsible for generating the circadian cycle and also generating uh, the underlying uh, sleep staging. So if you have disruption, if you have degeneration of this particular nuclei, you're going to have REM, le less REM sleep. Having less REM sleep is uh, not as beneficial for a patient's waking up feeling refreshed. They're going to have less slow wave sleep, more disruptions in their uh, sleep cycle, and as well as more light sleep stage, stage one and two, which is not as uh, fulfilling to the patient from an energy standpoint. Just to show you, if we're looking at specific neurodegenerative disease, I've just listed some of the underlying um, sleep disruption that you might expect to see. So with Alzheimer's dementia, insomnia, very common, circadian rhythm disorders. One in particular is the advanced sleep phase syndrome. These patients tend to feel very tired in the evening time. They go to bed at 7, 8, 9 o'clock, and then they get up at 3 or 4 in the morning, and, and there's no one to socialize with. You know, this is too early to start their day. Uh, so somnolence, daytime sleepiness, appears later in the course of the disease. Let's move to the alpha-synucleinopathies. This is a very fertile area of research, namely because um, there are specific sleep disorders, in one in particular called REM sleep behavior disorder, that can appear even before the underlying Parkinsonism takes shape, takes, uh, it becomes clinically apparent. To opathies, uh, there is not one particular uh, sleep disruption. They're all over the place. Probably insomnia is the most common. And of course, with ALS, we're going to see more problems with uh, sleep disordered breathing. Amyloidopathies, more commonly sleep uh, uh, circadian rhythm dysregulation, sleep disordered breathing is very common and actually correlates with the number of uh, APOP, APOE4 alleles with the alpha synuclinopathies, daytime sleepiness, sleep apnea, terrible sleep maintenance insomnia, and of course parasomnia such as uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. Sleep disruption in Alzheimer's tends to correlate Early is not going to be as disruptive as later stage of Alzheimer's where the patient can develop sundowning. There is a new theory that's really attractive and um, in the last two years or so, there have been new data that shows that during the night, this is when you have clearance of proteins, toxins, uh, proteinaceous compounds from the CSF and this is done through the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system is particularly active during the night. It helps collect all these proteinaceous byproducts into the, back into the uh, bloodstream and get cleared away from the CSF. And this correlates with better sleep, you have better, better clearance of these proteins. And if you get, don't get enough sleep, if sleep is poor, you may have accumulation of a, a protein such as a, uh, APOE4 alleles and, and a specific beta amyloids. So nowadays there is this new theory that uh, increased synaptic activity in patients who have Alzheimer's, for example, who have increased synaptic activity during the night because they have insomnia, can increase the production and precipitation of beta amyloids and beta amyloid uh, deposition in these patients can accelerate the underlying uh, neurodegenerative process. It's also been shown that Alzheimer's patients have increased orexintone. Orexin is a neurotransmitter that facilitates wakefulness. It's the one neurotransmitter that is missing in patients who have narcolepsy type 1. And what happens in these patients is that in Alzheimer's dementia, we find that there, the increase in orexin tone tends to correlate with poor sleep quality. And in mice, the sleep disruption increase in soluble fraction of tau in the brain, prompting more research, as, and this, you're probably going to see more data on this in months to come, showing that poor sleep in these patients can increase the deposition of tau that is really the core component of a 
um, uh, what you see pathologically in Alzheimer's dementia. So uh, the idea is, well, if you treat the insomnia, if you reverse the abnormal orexintone, can you potentially reverse the underlying neurodegenerative changes that you see? And this is really going to uh, be a fascinating area of, of uh, research in the, in the years ahead. Um, sound downing, very commonly seen in Alzheimer's dementia, and it's really related to a lot of different factors. Um, advanced cognitive impairment is one, underlying medical, underlying comorbid medical conditions, depression, early bedtime, sleeping in, in unfamiliar sleep environments, using sedative hypnotics. This is very different that, than what you would see in REM sleep behavior disorder. RBD, and, and I'll show you some videos, RBD is when the patient tends to act out their dreams and, and tend to be more aggressive and this occurs during REM sleep. Sundowning occurs sometime in the early evening. The patient is awake, and not, they don't have any dream enactment. They're just appearing to be very aggressive. But sundowning to an observer, to a family member, can appear very similar to RBD, which is what we try to make a differentiation when we see these patients. I'm going to spend a few minutes on sleep in Parkinson's disease. Um, this is important because um, you're going to see this in, in your practice. You're going to also hear about certain sleep disorders in Parkinson's that may also be present in Alzheimer's dementia. So let's, let's go through some of this. Uh, the first is that in terms of the bothersome symptoms to the patient, sleep is second to cognitive impairment and even more important than pain, depression, and psychosis in terms of impacting this patient's quality of life. Let me show you a case. So, and maybe we can increase the volume a little bit. I would appreciate that. That's, a, that's good. So this is a 64-year-old gentleman who came to the emergency room with a broken wrist experience while, fight, while um, he was having a fighting dream. This is how he came to clinical attention. And furthermore, for the last six months, he has been sleeping in separate rooms from his wife. Uh, after he had punctured during one of the strings. So clearly, very abnormal. This is a patient who has REM sleep behavior disorder. And let, let me go through a few scenarios. The first is, when you look at the video, he's not peaceful. He's fighting someone. There is supposedly an intruder in the house, and he's trying to get rid of the intruder. And you notice is on, on the left side is a fragment of his sleep um, uh, the, the fragment of the polysomnogram is sleep uh, recording, and you notice that his muscle tone is quite high. This is very abnormal for rapid eye movement sleep. Remember, in REM sleep, your muscle, tones are, muscle tone is supposed to be flat. Otherwise, all of you will be acting out your dreams. So, dream enactment with absence of muscle tone inhibition in the setting of of a Parkinson's disease is RBD until proven otherwise. So let me show you a few more examples. So here we have a few patients with RBD. And, and notice that the gentleman on the left side, this is a Japanese gentleman with a um, RBD, and there's, this is a depiction of culture-specific RBD. He's, he's dreaming as if he's a samurai fighter and when he was asked the next day what he was dreaming about, say, he said his boss was bothering him. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the dog was dreaming about, probably chasing uh, a rabbit. And, but you notice that any time these patients act out their dreams um, in this fashion, they can not only hurt themselves, but, but hurt the bed partner. In fact, the paradox of RBD is that the patient doesn't have the problem. The patient often sleeps very soundly. The wives are the one with the disorder. That's the paradox. And every time I see patients with, with RBD in my clinic, it's the wives who are often complaining. The, the patients sleep like a baby. And the wives are often bothered by getting punched, having daytime sleepiness, and having the sleep disruption. Here are the variety of underlying neurodegenerative disease seen in association with RBD, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy body and multiple system atrophy, all the alpha synuclinopathies. 
There are probably two phenotypes of RBD. There's a younger phenotype, which uh, where the RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder, is probably related to antidepressants. Underlying CNS lesion affecting the Russell Pons, where REM muscle atonia is generated. Whereas the older phenotype in patients over age 65 is generally related to the alpha synucleinopathies. Uh, early in the 1960s, um, Jouvet in, in, in Lyon actually lesioned uh, the Russell Pons, the, the area that controls motor movement during REM sleep. And, and he noticed that these cats developed aneuric uh, behaviors, that is, dream enactment behaviors. And the lesions were replicated, not by virtue of a lesion, but by virtue of having underlying alpha synucleinopathies being deposited in the brainstem later in the 1980s, where RBD was first uh, described in humans. And this is the paper. This is the initial paper describing RBD. Notice that uh, this is a new category of a parasomnia. Generally men, older men above age 60, uh, with aggressive dream enactment behavior. The episode starts as a sudden arousal out of REM sleep. The patient has complex dream enactment with a potential for injury. When the patient wakes up, he or she may or may not have a recollection. If they have a recollection, it's helpful because it means that the patient was probably in REM sleep and was dreaming. If they don't have uh, any recollection, it doesn't mean they don't have it. It's just that sometimes the patient may not uh, have full awareness of the episode, but it's not uh, a fact of um, uh, ruling out the diagnosis. Here's another patient was being monitored in, her, in the lab. So you can see the potential injury even when the patient is being monitored. So we always tell our technologists when we bring these patients for a sleep study to always protect the bedroom environment, always make sure that the rails are, are up because this uh, parasomnia, when the patient is having the parasomnia, not only at home but in the lab, they can uh, flail arms and kick and get injured in the process. This is just a 60-second fragment of a sleep study uh, from a patient who has REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, I just want to show you that uh, the area in red corresponds to the electromyogram uh, uh, leads, which measure chin tone and leg tone. The leg tone is right here. Actually, I can't show it because I don't have a pointer, but it's, it's the area right in the middle of the, of the picture, and the chin EMG is right on top, and you notice that this is abnormal. It should be flat. It should be completely flat, and in this patient's, uh, in RBD, the muscle tone is quite elevated. So the question is sometimes, what do we tell patients? What do we tell patients if we hear about dream enactment, the fact that they're dreaming and about, say, action-filled dreams, and what do we tell them if we see abnormal muscle tone during a sleep study? Uh, the, the answer is that you have to have a combination of both the dream enactment and the positive sleep study to make a diagnosis of RBD. So what does it mean when they have RBD? That's, that's really the central question. I'm just going to skip that. The, the important thing is that RBD can be the earliest manifestation of an evolving synucleinopathy. If we look at the Brock stages of Parkinson's disease, where stage one and two corresponds to the uh, earliest development of neurologic findings in this patient, such as anosmia, um, such as autonomic changes, depression, um, uh, color vision disruption, <laughs> RBD stands right there. RBD is one of the earliest symptoms in this particular patients who may develop Parkinson's disease later on. So the question is, if you know that the patient is at risk, can you develop a neuroprotective agent? Can you put them on a medication to stop the progression to full-blown uh, Parkinsonism? That's where you have a biomarker, a very stable and consistent marker for Parkinsonism 
where if you have the biomarker, if you have the disorder, you know that the patient will probably have the disease. And I'll show you data why we know that. So unfortunately, right now, there are no neuroprotective agents per se, with the exception of exercise. Exercise is the only neuroprotective agent in Parkinson's disease, and you've already heard earlier how exercise is critical for, uh, especially in middle, middle life, to help um, uh, prevent the uh, added risk of a um, lack of exercise with increased BMI on the neurodegeneration. Here's some data just to show you. This is a earlier data from the Canadian group showing that uh, patients who had been monitored, who were diagnosed with RBD, 20% of them were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in five years. 40% of them in 10 years, 50% in 12 years. This is data from um, early 2005, I believe. Let's look at 2014. This is from the Barcelona group, Aranzo et al. Uh, here the rates of phenylconversion are somewhat higher. A third after five years, two thirds after 10 years, and 91% after 14 years. What does it mean? So if a patient tells me that they're noticing that they're moving and acting out their dreams, or their bed partner tells me that, I want to make sure that I have the right diagnosis. So I, I bring them for a sleep study, I make the diagnosis, and then I have to have a conversation. Because this data is really critical. The patient has to know that there is a risk. I usually tell them that there may be 50 to 75% uh, chance that they may develop a neurodegenerative disease in about 10 years. I tell them that, and I, I'm being transparent about it. And the reason why, if I don't tell them that, they're going to go on the internet. And then they're going to come back and tell me, why didn't you tell me that there may be a risk for Parkinson's disease? So in a supportive way, I tell them that we don't know if and we don't know how long, but there, there is a potential risk. And I basically do a baseline neurologic exam, and I follow the patient every six months or so. Um, and, and I think most patients, no one has gotten very upset. They know that they may develop this condition. So if they have, they want to take a trip of a lifetime, they know they should probably do it earlier. So this advanced planning really helps the patient and it provides more credibility for my opportunity to really assist them as they manage through this process. This is why RBD therapy and RBD diagnosis is important. So the lady on the left is a patient with REM sleep behavior disorder, flew up out of her bed into the dresser and suffered a basilar skull fracture. The two uh, individuals on the right, again, patients who were one of the, the patient on the bottom, uh, he dreamt about an anaconda in his, in his bed and he was try, trying to suffocate the anaconda and then fell to the floor. I think he was watching uh, uh, the crocodile hunter or, or something. To, but but it's, it's really uh, bewildering. The types of behaviors that these patients are engaged with, it's always an intruder. It's always an animal trying to attack them. Bees, ants, uh, something. They, they never dream about anything pleasant. Rarely is a patient the attacker. They're usually the ones being attacked. So, just bear that in mind. They're not pleasant dreams. In terms of treatment, first and foremost, safety. Uh, when I see these patients, I tell them to go back home and act like a detective. Anything that looks sharp, they need to remove. Anything that looks like they're going to hurt them, themselves uh, around the bedroom, a sharp um, piece of furniture, glass, windows that are not protected, they need to ensure that they're not going to punch uh, a wall or a piece of furniture and get hurt. We've had some patients who never knew that this was a, a, an important diagnosis and, and a uh, real diagnosis that they thought this was a nightmare. And what they did is they used the handcuffs, uh, a seat belt that went over the patient to help protect themselves from having this particular abnormal behavior. This is a, one of my patients who, um, really, he was a prisoner in his own bed with all these contraptions to help uh, prevent his uh, dream enactment. 
we're going to have a video. So the sound, actually, let's move to the next one. I'm going to go real quick just to make sure I have the right one. Here we go. What I'm going to do is just, here we go. I think this is the one. So she's the wife. A seatbelt that went around the bed. He restrained his wrist. He, res he literally hogtied himself at night. This is how John used to go to sleep. Wrist and feet restrained. His body tied down. I don't just think I was getting out of bed. Maybe attacking my wife. And <coughs> to realize that I had no control over it. Like uh, Dr. Jekyll and uh, Mr. Hyde. So another term for this di disorder is the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde syndrome because the patients are very pleasant during the day and during the night they become uh, quite violent and aggressive and it's really a nice term to describe the dichotomy in how the patient appears uh, to an observer. In terms of pharmacotherapy, so level A treatment, safety. Level B therapy, either clonazepam or melatonin. My preference is melatonin simply because it's available over the counter. It's as effective, if not more effective, than clonazepam. And it doesn't have the sedative properties that uh, clonazepam has. It's not a respiratory depressant. The half-life of clonazepam is 40 to 60 hours. Melatonin is cleared very quickly. Recently, I've used melatonin time release, melatonin TR, 5 milligrams. The thing is, you have to use pretty high doses of melatonin. Most patients start at three milligrams of regular melatonin or go up to five milligrams TR and then increase the dose, uh, titrating to clinical efficacy. Surprisingly, however, clonazepam, even though it's sedating, it works very nicely for these patients as long as you monitor and you make sure that they use their CPAP if they have sleep apnea, I think you're in good shape. For refractory patients, we use a combination therapy of both melatonin and clonazepam. And uh, generally speaking, you should see very good efficacy with both of these medications. If you don't, you have to look for another uh, issue like patients using alcohol, caffeine, uh, being, uh, being placed on a new antidepressant that often makes RBD somewhat refractory to treatment. Now, I want to show you an interesting device that can be used as an alarm, that when the alarm is triggered, it sounds the wife's uh, voice calmly telling the patient to go back to bed. The interesting thing is that during REM sleep, our auditory threshold is surprisingly very, very low, equal to that during wakefulness. So you can tell patients to do things and they'll do that, but don't try it at home. It's just that this particular um, device works very nicely for very refractory patients. And I just want to show you, here's the device. It has an alarm. It has a trigger that if the trigger is released, if the patient is having a dream enactment, this is what you hear. Honey, you just had a bad dream. It's OK. Go back to sleep. All right, so let me show you an example. And you're done. Sometimes the wives do wonders. This, this, is a, this is one example where auditory uh, feedback is, is, was, was essentially therapeutic. So safety number one, uh, pharmacologic interventions, of course, for a lot of patients who have uh, frequent disruption of their nighttime sleep with RBD and end up uh, punching and hurting themselves. And of course, look for any uh, SSRIs or other antidepressants that could have uh, precipitated the RBD when there is a temporary relationship to when the patient started using them. Safety, 
Um, and let me move on to other facets of a, of a Parkinson's disease. Now, when again, as I mentioned earlier, is if the patient has RBD, we need to have a disclosure. We have to have a conversation. Thanks for the warning. I like to use a, uh, four Cs for RBD and that I want you to remember. The first C is clonazepam, 90% effective. Second C, carbrate, carbrate with a polysomnogram. Third, street, third C is a, have a conversation, a conversation with the patient and with a family member. And um, I think there is a fourth C, I don't remember it, but uh, <laughs> the effects of sleep deprivation, three hours last night. Just to tell you, one thing I, I noticed how sleep, you know, we were talking about how sleep deprivation is, is impacting memory. This morning, after getting my three hours of sleep, I, I had to submit a grant application, and that's why I was so sleep deprived. And I, I uh, took my cell phone, and I thought it was a shaving machine, and I started to shave myself <laughs> with it. That's automatic behavior that you see in narcolepsy. So that's, that's just interesting anecdote. Sleep disruption in Parkinson's. Here are some of the uh, underlying causes. Under, underlying causes could be related to hypocretin deficiency in the setting of Parkinson's, uh, underlying medications, nocturia. Later on in, in the setting of a, uh, end stage Parkinson's, you have a lot of uh, difficulties with dysautonomia and difficulties with a uh, nocturia. Nocturia is terrible, very refractory, and it leads to sleep maintenance insomnia. Here is more evidence to show that the hypocretin in Parkinson's is low. We can, there's some data showing that perhaps treatment with modafinil can be effective. Uh, RLS, Russell Sleck syndrome, is an urge to move the lower extremities, usually in the setting of a uh, periodic leg movements, which are the actual leg movements that go along with the, parking, with the uh, RLS. Compared to age match controls, uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients with PD will have uh, restless leg syndrome compared to about 5 to 10 percent of the population. Now, the problem is that the patient will not tell you, doctor, I have restless leg syndrome. They will never do that. They will always say it feels like an electric shock sensation or ants crawling on the legs. And if the one thing that you want to do is look for an urge. If the patient has an urge, they probably have RLS. And this is one patient from our lab who had terrible RLS um, with <coughs> terrible disruption of his sleep maintenance. The treatment, there are four FDA-approved drugs. One is a, an alpha-2 delta ligand, that's gabapentin and a carbol, and you have three dopamine agonists. If you're putting a patient on a dopamine agonist, what is the one thing you never want to forget to tell them about? So daytime sleepiness, right? What about another side effect? Compulsive behaviors, compulsive gambling. It can be seen in higher doses in the setting when, when we treat Parkinson's, but particularly here for restless leg syndrome, it's, it's an important side effect to go over. I'm just gonna finish with a, one anecdote which is about insomnia treatment. I wanna tell you that every one of your patients will go over, if they have chronic insomnia, they'll go over to the supermarket and use over-the-counter. Some will use alcohol. Alcohol is, is very enticing, but there is a problem. What happens when you fall asleep? You stop drinking. And that's the problem. So here's a patient uh, who completed a sleep diary, went to bed around 7.45, fell asleep at 9.45, woke up at 11, had scotch. <laughs> fell asleep at 11.30 p.m., woke up at 4 a.m., had another scotch. He crossed it out. I think he did have it. <laughs> and then he fell asleep at 4.15, woke up at 524 had another scotch. <laughs> so it just talks about how the, the half-life of alcohol is not, not good. Not only that, but it destroys your sleep architecture. It essentially 
uh, leads to a picture very much like you will see on the EEG, very much like you will see with fibromyalgia. But I just want to show you, here are the FDA-approved drugs. The first thing you want to do when you have a patient with insomnia is ask them, is it a problem of falling asleep, a problem maintaining sleep, or both? If it's both, you can see you can use the, the drugs that are approved for sleep initiation and maintenance. And if it's only a problem ma maintaining sleep, the drugs in, in yellow are probably appropriate. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put, package all the slides, I'm gonna resend it to the organizers. You should have it available online. And at this point, I'm gonna end and see, maybe I'll take one or two questions. Thank you for having me. Yes. The uh, RBD, the question is, what does RBD stand for? RBD stands for REM, Rapid Eye Movement, Sleep Behavior Disorder. Yes, in the back. Uh, good question. So did I correlate early Parkinson's disease with RLS? So I, the point I wanted to make about, to make about RLS is that compared to, no, to normal age match controls, patients with Parkinson's are at two to three times greater frequency of experiencing RLS. Now, I did not make the point that having RLS can put you at risk for Parkinson's disease. So I'm so glad you brought this up because a lot of people read about RLS, they read about RBD, and they confuse the two terms. Having RLS does not put you at risk for Parkinson's disease. Having RBD does. So just remember that differentiation. And restless leg syndrome is an urge to move, worse in the evening time, gets better with movement, gets worse with inactivity. Yes. So excessive increased exposure to light during the day depends when, if it's in early morning, if you're going outside here in Irvine in Orange County, it's, it's, you should actually get that light exposure, if, if especially for uh, older adults who have a disruption in their sleep cycle. Having the light exposure later during the day will delay the sleep onset. So having it early will help uh, having the uh, early light exposure for delayed sleep phase syndrome patients will help advance the sleep cycle. So for those teenagers who go to bed at 2 or 3 in the morning and can get, get up until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, right? you want to get the light exposure early. For older adults with the advanced sleep phase syndrome, you want to do the opposite. You want to have the light exposure later, probably around uh, 5, 6 in the afternoon. And if they can get the, that light exposure, light boxes can be quite helpful. This is what we used when I was uh, at the University of Michigan. Yes? Are you talking about the, uh, happy light? Say that again. I'm sorry. Happy light and 10,000? Yes. So the type of light that we're using is 10,000 lux or greater. Remember, lux is a unit of energy. So if you go to Amazon or on the web, make sure the light exposure is at least 10,000 lux. Yes. Hi. Uh, I just transferred from Huntington Beach to Citrus Hills Assisted Living. I do activities. And I've noticed in this building a lot of the residents fall asleep right after lunch. So how can you get them to encourage to go to activities right after lunch? Because I know it's probably not the healthiest thing to do. Good question. So every one of us is going to have that after lunch um, kind of a de de uh, depression of the alertness curve. This is normal between 1 to 3 p.m. There's a normal, predictable uh, delay, or, or rather uh, dip in the alertness curve. This is predictable. It's not abnormal necessarily. We worry about patients who are sleepy 24-7, who are waking up sleepy, going to bed sleepy, and they fall asleep every, every opportunity. This is the red flag. 
You know, here in the US, if you feel tired after noontime, you can either take a siesta or you can go to Starbucks, you know, and, and it's predictable. People get worried about it, but this is physiologic. And usually a power nap, 15 to 20 minutes between 1 to 3 p.m. is curative. will disturb your sleep. And he said, be sure and block all that stuff out. And uh, then I have a question about, what about red lights that are like uh, very common on clocks and things like that? Is, does the red light itself have the same action as the white light from a bright LED or something in disrupting your REM sleep? Good question. So very briefly, light exposure from uh, LE, from the computer screen, from an iPhone, iPad, any of those electrical devices, probably not a good idea before you go to bed. I, I tell every one of my insomnia patients not to do it. Not because the light is, is bad by delaying the, alert, the, the uh, sleepy, sleepiness signal from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, but people are very confused during the night as they text. You know, there is that uh, fight between sleep and wakefulness and our our ability to be cognizant is depressed. So to the second question about should it be blue light, red light, red light is probably somewhat more protective. Blue light is actually the powerful light that the, the signal of which is most powerful in stimulating the retinal ganglion cells that fit into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the, question, the, the bottom line, if you have insomnia and you're using your iPhones, computers, TVs, get rid of it. You want to have a, electric silence for at least two hours before bedtime. You know, dim light, boring book, not the Da Vinci Code <laughs> is the perfect magic. Okay. So did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.